Rocker Nation. What is going on, guys? Welcome to the Rocket Out Blog. It is Wednesday, February 5th, 2014. And on today's episode, guys, I have a very special roundtable panel all assembled for you. We're going to be discussing, basically, how to go about starting your very own record label. What it takes to run a record label, what are the importance of record labels in this day and age, what record labels are doing to try to adapt to newer times. All that and more will be discussed. But before we get to that stuff, we do have some rock music news to talk about, so let's not waste any time and get things going. So people are still talking about the Red Hot Chili Peppers performance at the halftime show at the Super Bowl this past Sunday, but they're not talking about how energetic they were or whether or not they belonged on the stage with Bruno Mars, but no, they're specifically talking about why the Chili Peppers didn't plug their instruments in while they were playing. Flea went on the Red Hot Chili Peppers website and wrote that since the music of their performance is pre-recorded and the only thing live are the vocals, there was no need to plug in the instruments. Simple as that. He went on to say that they could have plugged in their instruments, but then what would have been the point? Because everybody by now knows that all the music during the halftime show is pre-recorded. So instead of pretending like they were actually playing, they decided to just go out on stage and have fun with it. And I applaud Flea for writing this post. He didn't need to write it because again, everybody should know that by now, the only thing that's live at the Super Bowl halftime show is when you're singing. It's just annoying seeing some music websites and music blogs attacking Red Hot Chili Peppers. Why don't you plug in your instruments? Even though that's saying website knows that all the music is already pre-recorded. It, it's not live. So can we all just move on from this? Can we just come to the conclusion that yes, Red Hot Chili Peppers, the music during their performance was pre-recorded. Everybody knows it's pre-recorded. It's not live. And let's just move on to something else because that's what I'm going to do right now. On March 4th, the Brooklyn rock band The Men are releasing their newest album, Tomorrow's Hits. And if you guys didn't hear the first single off this album, Pearly Gates, oh, Go and listen to that. It's amazing. And after you listen to that song about five, six times, go ahead and listen to the new song that they just released off Tomorrow's Hits called Different Days, which is yet another massive rocker that you can happily turn up on your stereo and just drown in its sound. And I tell you what, based on the tracks that I've heard off this album so far, this album, Tomorrow's Hits, currently sitting really high on my list of top rock albums of 2014, right up there with Against Me. And finally, guys, because I know how much you love it when I report about pop stars covering songs from our favorite rock bands. If you click that link down below in the description box, you'll be able to check out Miley Cyrus covering the Arctic Monkeys track Why'd You Only Call Me When You're High on her recent MTV Unplugged special. Now before you start booing and hissing, I'll be completely upfront with you. I listened to this track with a bit of hesitation because I was like, mm, I don't really know if she's going to capture the same performance as Alex Turner, but I'll tell you what. I was impressed. She's got a really good singing voice, regardless of her behavior, as stupid as that is. She can actually sing, and she actually made the song sound pretty good. A bit more country than pop, but it sounded good. So go ahead and check it out if you want to. The link is down below in the description box. And if at some point while you're listening to the song, you find yourself sticking out your tongue in a weird fashion and twerking on anything that moves, you, oh, you, you might want to see a doctor about that because I'm, I'm sure I'm almost positive that's not healthy. And that's the news you need to know, guys. But stick around because coming up after the break, we're going to discuss how you can start your very own record label. You know, I had a record label of my own at one time. You had a record label? That's pretty cool, man. What bands were on it? No, no, you misunderstand. I actually had a record label, the actual physical piece of paper that goes on the record. I had it once and then I lost it. Biggest regret of my life, I tell ya. I'm sure at some point in your life you've heard somebody say record labels don't matter anymore, they don't mean anything anymore, they're not relevant, bands can handle their own careers at this point. But, have you ever actually considered what goes into running a record label and what's involved in being a part of a record label? Well, I decided to find that out for myself. So yesterday, I gathered together the heads of three indie labels that are based out of Chicago, Illinois, and we discussed what exactly it takes to run a record label. We talked about whether or not record labels are relevant in this day and age, especially when bands are releasing most of their own music online. We talked about how record labels are involved in the development of bands, and they offer up some advice as to what you can do to start your very own record label. So if you've just been interested in this topic or you want to become the next burgeoning record mogul, you're going to learn something today. Check it out. I am joined by uh, three record moguls, rising moguls in the, in the industry. We have Nan Warshaw, who is the owner of uh, Bloodshot Records. Nan, what is going on? Hey. Uh, we also have uh, Tobias Jag, who, is, who runs the, uh, the, uh, the label Red Scare Industries. Tobias, what's up, man? Uh, hi, salutations, greetings, thanks for having us. And then finally, we have uh, basically like uh, the, the new kid in school. We have the man that runs Make Records out of Chicago, Illinois, one Jason Sizer. Jason, what's going on, man? 
Hey guys, let's start things off by each of you giving us a brief history, a brief summary of your label, Nan. Let's uh, let's start with you and Bloodshot. What is Bloodshot all about? Well, Bloodshot started in 1994. Um, it was a hobby that we got lucky and must have done a few things right, and it turned into a business. And we're about to be celebrating our 20th anniversary, which is pretty shocking in the indie world. Bloodshot, I would describe as a sound of indie rock uh, with roots inflections. And so those the root side of what we do can be everything from uh, bluegrass, uh, acoustic blues, traditional country, R&B, soul. So it's, it's a wide variety of roots inflections, but it's all through the lens of indie rock. I, Red Scare is from 2004. I was working at a record label in San Francisco called Fat Records. I had been there for a while. I went to school in the Bay Area at Berkeley, and I was interning there. And, um, had worked at Fat for a few years, started out doing mail order, and uh, which I think is also you know kind of crucial to any uh, any operation as anybody will tell you. But, yeah, you know, I kind of worked my way up from an intern to, like, signing bands at Fat Records. And... Um, at that point, at some point, I was like kind of interested in also putting out my own records, and uh, I had lots of friends, and that's kind of the, the two qualifying factors we have for Red Scare is, is your band pretty cool, and are you pretty cool? Because you can be pretty cool and have a bad band, or you can have a great band and be not very cool, but we try to get both of those things, and that kind of, uh, I think, describes the Red Scare family a little bit, and uh, yeah, as you said, it's mostly punk rock, indie punk, some acoustic stuff here and there, but yeah, we, we're in Chicago now and uh, stoked about it. We launched September 22nd of last year. Um, we have a 15-person staff. We focus primarily on EDM, electro-pop. Um, we have four artists signed to our label now. We have four EPs coming out around March 2nd. We have four albums coming out later in the year. We are a free music record label, um, meaning that we don't sell music to fans. Um, we work on a different business model than traditionally seen in music business. We're, we're a group of people that are just thinking music business just a little differently um, with a lot of the traditional ways it was done before. First of all, how do you even decide one day, you know what, I kind of want to just start a label and put out records on my own because this is what I like and I want people to know what I'm a fan of and then have that passion grow into something that has lasted now for, for 20 years because it's not easy for a label to stay in business for a uh, for as long as you have, especially uh, an independent label? Well, you certainly have to be passionate and so passionate that you can't not do it because there's plenty of easier ways to make a living. So, you know, to start, I think that by doing it organically for the right reasons and being so passionate, we couldn't help ourselves and we were fine working, you know, 60 hour weeks doing it. You know, that's what propelled it and, um, you know, finding just creative ways to get the word out. You know, our first release was a compilation. And so we went around town and had, um, I think, three different record release parties on their first release because there were, you know, uh, 12 or whatever. There were more than 12 local bands on it. And, you know, I, I think remaining frugal has been essential to our success, too, and um, not overreaching with staff or and finding creative ways to get the word out there about the records. And then I want to take this next question to you, Toby. Um, being someone that started out at another label, were, were there things that you saw at the label that you were working at where you said, it might be kind of cool if maybe I do it a little bit differently so that the way I handle my business, um, it's going to cater to a certain type of audience, and at the same time, I think it might be a better business model. One thing we've always tried to do is we, we'll do, like, bonus tracks for digital releases, or we'll do, uh, we put out our records a little early, and I don't know why more labels don't do this, because the band I tour manage, the Lawrence Arms, they have a record on Epitaph, which is a huge indie, um, and they, uh, you know, they're, their album leaked like three, three and a half weeks before, and it's like kids have no choice but to hear it illegally. So my thinking is if you put it out there, at least for Spotify or on iTunes, at least if people want to pay for it, they can. But if, if you don't make it available, they can't. And to me, I, you know, so that's some of the th some of the ideas we've kind of incorporated. And again, with, with the music industry, the way how fast it's changing now, there really isn't, you can't, like, there, there's college programs for like, hey, the music industry, here's what you learned, and this is, 
you know, if you could bottle and brand this stuff, it'd be easy, but you can't. It changes like every every few months. You know, the world is changing so fast, and I'm sure as as Make Records will tell you, uh, you know, there's lots of things you can do right now that are new to, to get music out. Jason, okay, so your 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 label, your record company, Make. I know you guys are uh, championing this idea of we don't sell music to fans. We we try to give free music. How do you manage to uh, to sustain uh, your label? How do you plan on keeping it going if music sales aren't your uh, number one? Um, Money maker. By giving away music, they're able. To, they have a greater potential to expand their audience, which leads to more tours, more merchandise. But also, we have other doors that we look open for: brand partnerships, product placement, advertising. If Make strikes a deal with, let's say, a brand partner or something like that, like that's not just a Make deal. Like we split that between our artists um, alike. So music opens the doors for other sources of revenue. Music is already free to fans if they want it to be. Fans purchase music more out of a respect for the artists that they have, more for, um, you know, because they want to support. And we open the doors for other ways of support um, for musicians, for our fans to do so. And it opens it opens bigger doors we, for, our, for our artists and for what we do. Why, me, why use a record label then? Why not just distribute their music on their own and just go about it independently? We deal with a lot of things for the artists, of course, with distribution. They could get it out themselves. They could do a lot of things. But we have a great team that works on um, marketing, um, press. You know, it's very hard being a one-man band. You know, you need a team. And luckily, we have a very big team of people that help our artists deal with a lot of things that, you know, people ignore, don't think that, you know, don't think about until they come up. Like, we have a, a very large team to help the artists with those things because our goal is helping them achieve their career goals. So... We help deal with that things, and for them, they just get to sit back and create good music. Is it structured as a 360 deal? Are you taking a percentage of these artists' performance um, income as well? I mean, clearly, you're you're looking to make up the difference in record sales mm -hmm. from from all the other income sources that labels traditionally get, like placement, you know, film, TV, advertising placement, and any things like that. But I guess are you also trying collecting a percentage of the artist's um, show income? Most of our deals are split between our artists, you know, in some fraction or another, um, in all areas where we do help them. So we do help uh, our artists uh, in relation to touring um, and scheduling those things and performances. So we do get uh, percentages of those things. Um, we help them acquire their advertising, product placement deals, and things like that. So we do get percentages of that as well. I mean, I'm just trying to compare it to the more traditional roles. You're acting as a booking agent, and in many cases, management. Yeah, um, we handle multifacets for our artists in those capacities. Um, we're actually um, going to start scheduling uh, shows for our artists coming up for the spring and summer. Um, so we deal with those things internally. Sometimes we outsource, but most of the things we deal with are internal. Um, so yes. As far as this this topic is concerned about whether or not labels are, uh, I guess, necessary in this day and age, because as you said, there are a lot of bands now that are getting their music for free. There are a lot of bands yeah. that uh, that you know that you know fans are just getting the music a lot earlier. Are labels necessary in this day and age when music is much more readily available uh, through the internet. When it comes to paying or not paying for music, yeah, I mean, I think they'll always be, we'll always be around because we develop bands and there's value in taking, why would you want to sign to a label? It's like, well, if you want to be a part of the Red Scare family because we're going to pair you up with other bands, whether or not this, the sentiment still lasts, there people still look to certain, you know, little niches of, of, of the music scene for tastemakers, you know. It's true, music is free. And that's because, like, I think a fundamental sort of breakdown in our in our values that, like, again, that, oh, just because it's free doesn't mean that you should take it, you know, just because you can't get, you know, we need to value the arts more, I think, in our culture. I don't, I don't want my bands to leak their music early because I want them to respect their, their music as much as I respect it, you know. What they need is a team of people behind them helping them 
do the publicity promotion and marketing and booking. And so they need that team of people if they're going to make a, a career out of it. And whether that team is a record label or not, it, it's necessary to further your career. And so if you don't go with the traditional label, then most commonly you have to assemble that team. Yes, it's much easier to get your own music out there today than ever before, but there's now billions of specks of sand on the beach. And so how do you get that your speck of sand noticed? How do you get attention focused on it? How do you get that spotlight shown on that when there's so many out there? And so that's why you need that team behind you to get noticed. There's lots of different models possible, but the, the band, the artist still needs all those pieces you know, all those people behind them doing all the different jobs to build their careers. Why not just have a band manage their own music and then if they need to get their name out, just sign with a, a PR company or a publicity company as opposed to uh, an actual record label? I mean, nowadays, what does a record label offer specifically that a band can't get through somebody to help manage them or through a PR company or something along those lines? Uh, the first piece of the pie is funding and you have to have the money to hire all those different people. If you want someone doing pub, you know, doing publicity, someone else doing radio promotion or, or whatever the new media is, um, and uh, someone working publicity along your tour dates, someone doing your booking, all those people have to be hired and they're not cheap. If you're going to hire an indie publicist, you know, the established New York or LA ones, you're talking five grand and up. But then it's putting the team together and having the right team and having the people who know what might work and who are in a day in and day out. And yes, you could put together a bunch of different companies, but then you have to get them talking to each other and working together. You know, then when it comes to selling records, the record labels, the indie labels that are adapting day in and day out to the new changes in the industry, the new opportunities, um, can find ways to sell the records. And certainly, you know, until you're at a certain level, you're not making a living off of music sales, but it's a great supplement to, you know, shows and merch and all the other ways you're earning money. When you think about, you know, a musician, you know, talent still always has to be cultivated. Uh, it always still has to be developed. And every artist is still a brand at the end of the day, even though, you know, they could be the most talented musician, but there's still other components that go into that. So we treat, we let our artists know that, hey, you are a walking brand. You are your career. You are those things. So we provide them... Um, a lot of different artist development, dealing with their individual music to their style, from our stylists that we have that we have them deal with, from um, our public relations team that goes over them with, you know, just how to deal and carry themselves on a daily day basis as a musician. But also, um, as Nan was saying uh, previously, it is about the team that you do have that is there. Um, you know, we have a great team that is always thinking out the box to really help market and promote and direct people to their music. We provide our artists with a lot of things and we're very lucky that we have people um, with various backgrounds um, to cover those things. So we like to bring our artists' visions to life. Did you, say, did you say that you have a stylist? Yeah. I can't even get my bands to take pictures of themselves. But, you know, the band Against Me, actually, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they just released a record a couple weeks ago and it's big. They just played Letterman last week and they were they were in, like, Esquire and these huge press stuff. And they put their own record out, but yeah, they went out and they probably got uh, Nasty Little Man, which is a big publicity company, and, and they do this kind of stuff. So it can be done, and especially if you're a big band, I don't understand why maybe you would be on a label, um, except a lot. some bands don't even know how to hire a publicist, for starters. When it comes to like publicity and scheduling interviews or even routing a tour and shit like that or getting the um, manufacturing components together for, for a product, I mean, like, you know, they're, they, they can't do it. Most people don't want to do that. It's a lot of hard work. They don't know how to do it, and they'd rather focus their energies on being creative. So I think bands will always need some sort of people to enable them, and in our case, that's what we do. We develop bands who take them out of the house shows and get them to the small club part. It goes from there. If someone today 
wants to start their own label. They say, hey, okay, I think I know enough about music. I have a pretty good idea of how the business works, and there are a lot of bands that I really like and a sound I really like. I want to start my own label. What would be one of the first steps that you would recommend somebody uh, somebody do to uh, to start their journey of being a, a, a record mogul? Um, look at the needs that you need to fill. I remember that's what we did, um, myself and a co-founder of Make, uh, Tiffany Lee. You know, we knew what we were good at. Um, you know, my background is in artist development and branding. Um, she's an entertainment accountant. So we knew that we needed, you know, marketing and public and public relations people and image people. And we knew we needed video teams and, you know, we needed social media people to deal with those things. So the first step is looking at what your skills are, seeing what your needs are as a label and finding out how you can fill those gaps and also be willing to understand that you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to have some failures. You're going to have musicians necessarily that had, you know, they were really talented musicians, but maybe they didn't have the work ethic or they didn't have, uh, you know, some of the other intangibles. And sometimes you have people with all the intangibles and not necessarily um, you know, the, the, the music ability. So you have to also figure out how you want to deal with those challenges um, to get musicians to the height of their career. My, my real answer is don't, don't start a label. It's rough out there, you know. Um, there are labels that have sprung up that have um, documented really cool scenes that I don't know about. So, you know, if you think you're part of something special, um, I guess go ahead and document it. It's, it's, it's a drag to work with people who are dicks. It makes sense to just work with people that you have a, a friendly relationship with. And, and it's, it sucks to work with people who are disrespectful. So, you know, in a perfect world, um, work with people who are cool and uh, find your own, your own uh, little niche and, and, you know, go for it. But, again, be warned, uh, you're just going to lose a bunch of money. Don't do it. I mean, there's plenty of easier ways to make a living. Uh, and so you have to be... You know, so driven that you have no choice and that that's why you want to do it. I mean, starting any small business is a challenge, but um, a record label has way more challenges than your average small business. But if you're, if, if you're headstrong and set in doing it, learn as much as you can about it. Intern. Intern at, you know, get internships at a variety of other labels. See how other people do it so that you have a sense of what you should do, what you want to do, what you won't do. There's so many parts of it that are really ugly and abhorrent that I stay away from as much as possible. But just working in this business, you have to, you know, get your hands dirty some of the time. And, and so it's, it's a balancing act to stay true to yourself and the artists uh, and further their careers and feel good about it at the end of the day. Well, listen, thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your schedules. I, I really do appreciate it. And believe me, I've learned way more than I, uh, than I thought I knew about record labels. So thank you guys for taking the time. Again, we've been hanging out with Dan Warshaw, owner of Bloodshot Records, Tobias Jag, owner of Red Scare Industries, and Jason. Sizer, the owner of Make Records. Thank you guys so much for taking the time and best of luck to all of you. And that's it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Really do appreciate it. And as always, let us continue to grow the show. Like and favorite the videos, subscribe to the channel, like and follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and visit us at consequenceofsound.net. And I'll see you guys on Friday for an all-new episode of The Reob. So until then, horns up! You know what to do, man. Rock it out! If you started your very own record label and you could sign one band, any band you wanted to your label, who would it be?